Hey folks, uh, we are live. We are going to uh, continue development of the 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons Martial Powers Project that will be publishing on the DMs Guild when it's done. It's an effort of creating an alternate spellcasting system that marshals can use to create instant and sustained effects to give them the same type of flexibility and options to build their own sort of feature list similar to spellcasters selecting spells to prepare to modify their action economy. So we're going to do that. Uh, give me a second here to check my channel, make sure I'm coming through clearly and uh, go through my, my intro spiel and then we'll dive into some development for an hour my or so intro today, spiel, so. And then we'll dive into some sounds like my signal's coming through clearly. That is good news to start. Let's see, checking all my bits here, make sure things are in place. And let's see where we are at. Hold on. All right, good. Okay, great. So, uh, intro spiel. Hey, uh, my name is Phil Kearney. I create role playing game supplements, I publish them online as PDFs. Uh, currently, I'm focusing my attention on 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, there are a slew of uh, links in the description down below to other works that I have published so far, including the Color Man of Spellpoint variant rules that you can see the cover to on screen right now. Um, all the work that I produce on DMs Guild are 100% free preview, so you can read anything that I'm putting on the DMs Guild. Uh, you can read it at no cost, but almost all of it comes with assets and additional tokens and um, other quality of life things to use in your campaign that are included when you make a purchase. So if you are, uh, if you if you like the, the work that I do, consider uh, supporting the channel in that manner. Uh, give me one more second here. There. There. Good. Okay, great. So yeah, if uh, like if you were to check uh, on the uh, the color man of spell point rules here, uh, if you go into the link, click on it. Each each of the books has its own landing page. If you go to the landing page on a desktop or a tablet, underneath the the cover image uh, is a link that says full preview. If you're on a mobile phone, over on the right hand side, there's an eye icon. If you click the eye or the full preview link, either way, it'll throw open up a PDF for you to read the entire document. And the links down below. There's probably about 150 illustrations that I produce to put into these uh, to these books. So if you're an art enthusiast, peel them open, check out the work that I built. Uh, if you're a D&D enthusiast, read through them as well, check them out. If it's something that you think is interesting, as value to your game as either a player or a DM, or if you find yourself coming back to take a look at this stuff in the future, it probably is adding value to your inspiration of your game. Consider making a purchase to support the channel. I've also just posted that I'm alive on Twitter at Phil Kearney, F-I-L-K-E-A-R-N-E-Y. If you want to get notifications that I'm live in the future, uh, you can follow me on Twitter. I always post that I'm going live there as I have just now. Uh, in addition, you can support the channel by uh, like, subscribe, um, hit the, and hit the bell icon to support the stream. Um, so that uh, YouTube can recognize they, that we value long form design. So what do we do? We build a document, we, we get an idea about something that we can put uh, as, an, uh, as an option for Dungeons and Dragons. We then play test it. If the play test goes well, we flesh out the wording so that it makes sense. We then hire an editor to put it through the natural language filtering that uh, the Chicago Style Guide and that was Wizards of the Coast uses for communicating and conveying ideas. Uh, once that document is uh, is chewed up by our editor and passed back to us, we then put it into a layout uh, program. I use Word. Uh, we then make the, the, the text sit on the page pretty, and then any gaps that are left open in the page, we fill with artwork, and then we publish it. I do all that here on stream. Um, this stream here is developing the text. In the mornings, Monday through Saturday, I do um, asset development for the Spelljammers Adventures in Space a supplement that we've been producing, Spelljammers Combat and Exploration. And on Mondays and Thursday nights, I do cartography for an Eberron adventure that we'll also publish on the DMs Guild uh, that is currently going through the editing process right now. So when the Spelljammer book is done, 
that'll upload to the DMs Guild and be taken off my plate. We'll then move the Eberron adventure forward in the production cycle. I'll be working on Eberron image assets, character and, and artwork and stuff um, Monday through Saturday in the mornings like I do for Spelljammer right now. And then uh, Monday and Thursday evening will now be allocated to the Martial Powers project once that's completed. And then my Tuesday lunch stream, I'll probably do something like, I don't know, Dragonlance or something like that. Whatever ne Whatever's next in the pipeline. But, uh, but for now, I'm going to set a 20 minute timer so that we can keep an eye on where we're at on today's stream. I'm gonna take a sip of coffee and we're gonna get back into this. So we're on, where are we at anyway? We're on, um, what is this, episode 59? So we've been we've been developing this Martial Powers project on a weekly basis for over a year now. I've been play testing it. My team is 18th level at my home table and we've been play testing it since 12th level. So we're pretty happy with how it's coming along so far. There's still tweaks and stuff that we're doing to each of the individual powers. But today's project is uh, we are translating the uh, different classes, uh, subclass options for Barbarian, Fighter, and Rogue into the uh, martial power paradigm. And for those MTG enthusiasts that might be tuning in from Dice Tries channel, hey guys, uh, thanks for being here. And this mana system is designed to not only just be generic universal spell points like the DMG or like key, but it also uses the color mana spell point variant rule system that we developed on the DMs Guild. Uh, that allows you to um, uh, devote your mana to different colors to reflect the uh, the color philosophy that your character follows. Or if you're like playing Strixhaven, the college that they belong to, like Lorehold, for instance, is white and red. Or like if you're playing Ravnica, if you're um, if you're a Boros Legion character that follows white and red magic. Uh, or like if you're in the um, um, Theros campaign. Is, uh, I believe it's Eero that, or Eros. Uh, Theros is by far my weakest uh, campaign setting, but I believe it's Eros is the god of creativity in the forge. I think that's white and red magic as well. Someone in the comments will probably correct me on that. But there's so many different ways in the Magic the Gathering worlds to uh, to define your character by color philosophy. And if you, if you check out in the link down below the color mana spell point variant rules, you'll see how we take those identities and create a, uh, a ludo narrative, a mechanical um, expression of what that color philosophy is for spellcasters by assigning spells different colors and then allocating your or devoting your spell point pool uh, to the different colors to cast the different spells. Like if fireball is red, lightning bolt is red. You need to have red mana to do that. Boros Legion characters are going to have white and red magic primarily. They could dip into something else, but if you're going to stay true to your guild, it's just going to be white and red magic, which means that you're going to be picking up all the white and red spells and potentially spending research time to learn or, or hunting for information to gain access to, like say, blue or black spells and get them onto a white or red spell list so you as a Boros character can use those spells as well. So this martial power system offers 140 some odd powers uh, that you spend mana to trigger. You got your mana progression table here, which is the same as the mana progression table for spell casters and the point variant rules that we have down below. This is just an alternate magic system that emphasizes instant effects uh, um, self-sustaining effects and point-and-click uh, effects like throwing somebody across the room or like putting them in a telekinetic bubble or reading their thoughts, stuff like that. But it's it's not spell casting. It's I, I do this thing and, and I spin the magic while I do it and it automatically triggers, which we'll probably get into further here. But if you want the full uh, the full discourse, the full history, check out the, the Martial Powers playlist that's on my channel here on YouTube. And you'll see us walking through the entire process from episode one up through now, episode 59. So um, let's see what we're going to do first is, so we had originally created the Barbarian and we created a, uh, a unique path, Bath of the Furious Power, that leans into mechanics, like all the, all the rage mechanics 
of that system are built around the mechanics of martial powers, exploiting them, triggering effects from it, um, uh, gaining added leverage out of it. But there's so many other subclasses that exist for the barbarian already that don't use these powers. We're creating a basic scaffold that basically allows all of these classes to gain Eldritch Knight amount of mana, basically like level one to four, right? Uh, they get 20 mana over the course of 20 levels and they can spend them on powers and you can learn powers similar to an Eldritch Knight or an Arcane Trickster, which you can check the backlog of uh, previous streams to see all the specifics behind that. But originally we just had the one Path of Furious Power was the only way to gain access to this, but the Ranger, the Paladin, they can use all these powers on top of their normal classes. They just get to swap out spells for powers if they want to. So we spent a long time on previous streams going through all the monks, all the paladins, all the rangers subclasses and redefining them using uh, the martial powers. What, what changes we make using martial powers to affect these classes? Now we're going back through that same process for the barbarian fighter and the rogue, taking each subclass translating them into the martial powers paradigm and granting them a bit additional powers kind of like uh, some like casting subclasses get additional spells so we're giving you not only do you get all of the powers that you would have just by buying into the system in the first place uh, up to 16 of them at 20th level but you also each subclass gets the stack of curated powers that they gain access to so um, a total of eight of them. And then at 17th level, you get to modify and lower the cost of some of the more expensive powers that you picked up along the way. So we're going to go through right now and look at the uh, Path of the Beast, which is a barbarian subclass. And we're going to translate it into the martial powers paradigm. And then we're going to curate a list of powers to add on to the, uh, the, the path of the beast on top of it. So this is us going through that process beginning now. Oops, we had ancestral guardians two weeks ago. We did battle rager last week. And ended up building a pretty fucking cool character as a result of it. I'd actually, I would legitimately play a battle rager using this system. I think it's pretty cool. Uh, beast. Is that all it is? Path, form of the beast. It's Battle Rager Beast. So we'll clear our list for now. Not sure which uh, which powers we're going to make more efficient in the end. We won't know that until we actually build it out. So, hey, Alan, it's good to see you. Let's see. So features, features for the beast is form of the beast. Let's just flush out the scaffold and then we'll build out. So form of the beast. Bestial soul. Bestial soul. Bestial soul. Uh, what else is there? Uh, infectious fury. Call of the Hunt. That's 10th. Call of the Hunt. So let's see what these things do. Some of them might not need any changes. Some of them will. Some of them may already be powers. Like I may have, hmm, a number of the powers that we have in our list were inspired by subclass features. So during this process, we may find a subclass option already exists that is uh, that is filling the role of um, of one of the subclass options we have here. So we'll have to we'll have to assess that as we go along. Uh, whether we're going to build out a feature itself or just simply say you gain the blank feature, you know. But you're already getting a power list on top of it. So if I can avoid that, I'm going to. 
because just having a bunch of features which are gain of power and then a, another list of gain more powers uh, plus you have all the powers you just gain by itself it's like I mean that's a solution it was the original solution when we just had Path of Fury uh, and then you would build out each of the subclasses whatever kit of powers you want but now that we're going through the paradigm again kind of having to redefine how that approach works. So I'm gonna kick down here to the power list. So that so you can see here we have all the all the subclasses for the ranger and the whatever. Anyway, kicking through that stuff. Um, down into, I should probably start a Discord channel and, and start sharing this stuff on the Discord as well. But uh, I'm not there yet. So, okay, a list of martial powers. There's exploits, which affect die rolls and movement stuff. Uh, maneuvers, which are like point and click effects. Uh, there's uh, reactions, which are self-explanatory. Strikes are modified smite spell effects that, in, that any of these martial classes can gain access to that, that paladins just do better. Uh, there's sustain powers, which are, which are basically um, self-cast buff sustained effects then you can also uh, beyond that spend powers to learn different types of damage that you just deal by default instead of your weapon damage that you know like like if I learn how to deal fire damage then whenever I make an attack I can choose fire damage instead of my weapon damage if I want and by fifth level I could do advanced stuff but by fifth level uh, honestly we're gonna see what one D&D &D does to resistances and uh, and immunities and stuff, they may be changing that stuff. So obviously we'll have to modify this whole system once one D&D gets dropped into 60 or whatever it becomes. But the other thing that you can spend points on as well is feats. So you've got, you've got feats, damage types, sustained power, strikes, reactions, maneuvers, um, and exploits. So there's a ton of stuff that we can do with the, with the, with the, the list of powers that we get to learn. So you could like not be interested in fucking around with a mana pool at all and instead just spend all of your powers on fuckloads of feats so that whenever you like, like level four, eight, 12, whatever, instead of spending additional mana on or spending additional resources on more feats, you're spending your, your power budget on feats and instead all of your feet, uh, all of your character feats become ASIs. So you get to gain your strength, your constitution, your dexterity, etc., and you get a crap load of feats with this as well. Or you can choose to have a mana fueled power that you spend the resource and you can do the thing. So there's a lot of different ways you can dice and optimize the use of the characters. But um, yeah, pretty excited about it. So all right, so that's enough. That's enough of yabble yabble. Let me uh, let me get into the actual beast here. So we're going to open up a, a new word thing here so that we can take a look at what's going on with form of the beast. Dot, 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 dot. So we enter a rage. You can transform revealing the beast of power within you until the rage ends. You manifest a natural weapon. It counts as a simple weapon, melee weapon for you and you add your strength modifier to the attack and damage rules when you attack with it as normal. You choose the weapon's form for uh, each you know, form each time you rage. Bite. Uh, it deals piercing damage. You regain a number of hit points equal to your proficiency bonus, provided you have less than half your hit points when you hit. Claws. Each uh, of your hands transforms into a claw which you can use as a weapon. If it's empty, it deals D6 slashing damage on a hit once on each of your turns when you attack with the claw using the attack action. You can make one additional claw attack as part of the same action. That's really nice. Tail, you grow a lashing spiny tail that deals D8 piercing damage on a hit. Uh, you know, reach uh, with a reach property. If a creature you can see within 10 feet of you is hit, you, uh, uh, oh, if a creature you, you can see within 10 feet hits you with an attack roll, you can use your reaction to swipe your tail and roll a D8, applying a bonus to your armor class equal to the number rolled, potentially causing the attack to miss you. Okay, I'm, I'm okay with this 
in the core. I'm gonna modify it though. Of course I'm gonna modify it. So we'll take the basic of it. Bite, you know, your mouth transforms into a bestial muscle and, or great mandibles, your choice. It deals, uh, it deals damage equal to your power die on a hit. And that third level, your power die is a D6. And then at ninth level, it becomes a D8. And then finally, it becomes a D10. So while these offer a static D6 or D8 damage, uh, we're going to evolve from a D6, D8 to eventually a D10. So it'll be a little less in the beginning. It'll be a lot more in the end. Uh, bite, your mouth transforms into a bestial muzzle. You know, the deal is damage equal to your power die on a hit. It deals piercing damage equal to your power die on a hit. Copy, paste, tail, period. It deals piercing damage. It deals slashing damage. And has the reach property. If a creature you can see within 10 feet of you hits you with an attack roll, you can use your reaction to swipe your tail and roll a power die. Applying a bonus to your AC equal to the number rolled, potentially causing the attack to miss you. So there you go. That resolves that. Uh, once on each hit, you turn to damage a creature that bites you. You regain a number of hit points equal to... Gain a number of hit points equal to the damage rolled uh, equal to the result of the power die rolled. Provided you have less than half your hit points when you hit. Once on each of your turns, when you damage a creature with this bite, okay, cool. Uh, claw. Each of your hands transforms into a claw. Once on each of your turns, when you attack with a claw using the attack action, you can make one additional claw attack as part of the same action. Yeah, I think I'm okay with these. Bold. 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 Easy peasy. Number six, let's look at Bestial Soul. Best Soul? Feral power within you increases, causing the natural weapons of your form of the beast to count as magical for the purpose of overcoming resistance and immunity to non-magic attacks. You can also alter your form to help you adapt to your surroundings when you finish a short or long rest. Choose one of the following benefits, which lasts until your next short or long rest. Yeah, I'm good with this so far. Let's, uh, let's copy, paste, copy, paste. Uh, feral power within you causes and then let's go attacks. Uh, you can also perform uh, climbing. So let's go with bold, bold, bold. Uh, feral power within you increases, uh, causing the natural weapons of your form and your body to count as magical for the purpose of... Oh, mm, uh, let's see. Uh, 
you can also alter the form to help you adapt to the surroundings when you finish a short or long rest. Choose one of the following forms, which lasts until you finish your next short or long rest. Okay. Uh, you gain a climbing speed equal to your walking speed, and you can climb difficult surfaces, including upside down on ceilings without the need. Jump, athletics, extending your jump by a number of feet equal to the check's total. I'm okay with that. Okay. No changes. There was no need for changes there, so let's just leave it be. Uh, when you hit a creature with your natural weapons while you're raging, the beast within you can curse your target with rabid bury. Let's. When you hit a creature with internet, you're gonna curse the fury. The creature must succeed a wisdom saving throw. Keep it going. Eight plus con plus prof, or suffer one of the following effects. My choice. Two D twelve psychic damage. Jesus. Okay. Uh, the target must use its reaction to make a melee attack against another creature of your choice that you can see. The target takes two D twelve psychic damage. Is there a way for me to game that? This is what? What is this? Tenth level? You're using a D eight at tenth level. That's up to twenty four. Target takes psychic damage um, equal takes an amount of psychic damage equal to your max rank of power gained as a barbarian. Uh, the target takes an amount of psychic damage equal to the result of a number. This is a horrible, this is horrible. Number of power dice equal to, <laughs> that is the absolute fucking worst sentence in the world. But the math is beautiful. Here's, here's why this math is beautiful, right? It says right here, it says, um, too far. Okay, 10th level, right? This is a 10th level feature. Deal, it deals 2d12 psychic damage. 10th level, right? Your max rank is three and your power die is a d8. So at 10th level, you roll a number of power dice equal to your max rank gained as a barbarian. That's the way to say it. You gain um, deal damage. Uh, number of power dice equal to the max rank gained as a barbarian. Deal psychic damage equal to the result of rolling a number of power dice. Fuck that's clunky. I hate, I hate saying equal twice in the same sentence. This is, this is why we hire editors, by the way, because editors um, that work well, like Ken Carcass, uh, Stuart Braz, um, Hits and Dave, um, Adam Hancock, Ryan Langer. Uh, these are all these are all people that I've had editing my work in the past that have done a fucking fantastic job. Real professionals. All of them have really successful RPG products, both inside the 5e D and D game sphere as well as outside of it, as uh, independent Kickstarters, um, OSR, Cipher System, Call of Cthulhu. Good shit. Good good guys. 
Um, so let's see. Deal psychic damage. Um, the target takes... Uh, Damage equal to the result. Mm. Hmm. Target takes an amount of psychic damage. Roll a number of power dice equal to your max rank gained as a barbarian. The target takes psychic damage equal to the result of the roll. There's a, there's a really big effect here in the game that because uh, multi-class, the way that multi-classing works is all the classes curve together. So like if I were five levels of fighter, five levels of rogue, five levels of barbarian, five levels of ranger, uh, if I had all four of those classes, five each, I'm still going to be considered 20th rank uh, as, a, uh, as, a, as a channeler. I'll still have access, I can still channel up to five mana and I'm going to have anywhere between 20 and 40 mana between those classes. Like if I have, if I have five barbarian, five rogue, five ranger, and five paladin, I'm going to have 30 mana overall uh, on a long rest, uh, because the the mana uh, the the mana pools stack up. Five plus five plus ten plus ten, uh, ten for the hybrid classes, which are uh, the the monk, paladin, and ranger, and then the martial classes are barbarian, fighter, and rogue. So it'd be five plus five plus 10 plus 10. That's a total of 30 mana at, as a long rest. I'd still have up to fifth rank. I could channel up to five mana at a time in this process. But since all those classes are only fifth rank, I can't gain any powers that are, uh, I can only gain powers up to second rank because none of the classes have learned or have, have gained individual powers higher than second rank. So I can pick from up to second level rank, even though I can channel up to five mana while, uh, while channeling any of those powers. And my die and my power die will eventually build up to a D20 because the power die isn't modified. The nice thing though, is that the known powers is by class, not cumulative. So five, 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 that's a total of 24 powers learned across the four classes as opposed to only 16 as a single class. But again, that single class is gonna be able to learn fourth or fourth rank powers, the high end shit, while all the other classes are, are limited to more powers, but lower level. So if you stay single focus in a single class, you can gain the highest rank powers, but you know less of them as opposed to uh, multi-classing into multiple classes gives you a lower power level, a lower rank of power overall to learn from, but you'll have more powers learned. Otherwise, it's all the same. So fun balancing factor there uh, for those optimizers at home. Like um, and and worth noting, uh, powers max out at fourth rank. So if you're like an eldritch knight or an arcane trickster using the spell casting method and just want a little bit of power added to your spells, you still get your 13 spells known over the course of 20 levels. You still get your fourth level spells at 19th level, but you could instead choose to learn fourth level power, fourth rank powers at 19th level instead of a fourth level spell. And you would still be able to use the, uh, the, the, uh, the D10 hit, uh, the D10 power die for those powers. Uh, and if you wanted to, you could use the known powers instead of the Eldritch Knight spellcasting progression, but you would still have the 
uh, first at third, second at seventh, third at 13th, and then fourth at 19th because you get all because you have the option of gaining spells instead of powers. So that's a that's a fun compromise that you can make, but it blends these things together in interesting ways. So like you could go say, like like you could go Ranger 13, and then like say Eldritch Knight 7. And you'd still have access to fourth ranked powers through your ranger, which is the entire list. But you would also then be able to have access to spell casting from the Eldritch Knight up to second level on top of it to pepper in there. Plus all the class features from whatever ranger. Um, oh God, yeah. If you want to have, if you want to cap out your ranger, you'd have to go to 14th level, wouldn't you? Oof, God, options abound. But that's the that's the fun of building the multi-class. Having multi-class work with each other in that manner lets you play with that optimization exercise. So anyway, that's that's a quick a quick dissertation there. Um, let's see, you can use equals your proficiency bonus and you regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. Uh, you can also, uh, when you finish a long rest, or you can spend, what is this, 10th level? Max rank is three, that's expensive though. Target uses this reaction to make a melee attack against another creature. That's a, that's a goading power. And then roll a number of power dice equal to your max rank, gain this barbarian, the target takes psychic damage equal to the result of that. Or you can spend two mana, two fury points, Tenth level, that's nine, one, two, three, four. You get four of them as a, as your proficiency bonus. Uh, or you can, yeah, that feels right. Or you can spend two fury points to regain. At the beginning of your turn. Don't have any uses left. You can spend two mana, two fury. There. So if you use up all your uses of it, and if you're raging at the beginning of your turn as a free action, while raging as a while raging at the beginning of your turn as a free action, it's probably. <laughs> this is just the worst structured sentence ever. But I like that. Being able to spend mana to be able to regain the power, that's, re that's really useful. And it's scaling with the system, so that works well too. Plus your proficiency bonus. And if you're using the, well, this, this doesn't use that, that doesn't use that class. So this is pretty good as it sits. So we will Infectious Fury. There you go. Hey. Hey, how you doing, Fred? Uh, you can use this feature a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus and you regain all uses when you finish a long rest. While raging, at the beginning of your turn, if you don't have any uses left as a free action, you can spend two fury points to regain one use. And then Call of the Hunt. What, what does Call of the Hunt do? How are, we gonna, how are we gonna rebuild that? And then we'll, and then once we figure this last one out, we'll then go into the power list and, and pick out the, uh, the eight powers that we want them to gain for free on top of their selection of 16 powers that they can just learn. And we'll talk about that for a little bit too. But first, let's just finish fleshing this out. And once the, once the Path of the Beast is done, we'll go into the fighter next and we'll, we'll pick out, I think it's the Arcane Archer that we'll work through. And if we have enough time, God's willing, we will. If we have enough time, uh, we'll also do the Assassin for the Rogue today. But I'm on vacation this week, so I get to spend more time on stream than I normally would because I don't, I'm not on my lunch break. I have the day off. 
so life is good. I am, I am very happy with my world right now. This is uh, every year in May, as a uh, as a birthday gift to myself, I take a week off of my day job and act as though I am a full time content producer. So mo most like everyone else, um, professional RPGs is is a side hustle that I run, and um, so it's it's uh, it's fun to act as though I'm a, a full time as though my as though I earned all my income and supported my family through this endeavor. God, what a prayer. Um, so, okay, great. We're looking at call of the hunt. Uh, you're, uh, you, um, it's the beast within me that grows. Uh, the beast within me grows so powerful that I can spread its ferocity to others and gain resilience from them joining my hunt. When I enter my rage, I can choose a number of other willing creatures I can see within 30 feet of me equal to my constitution modifier, minimum of one creature. Uh, I gain five temporary hit points for each creature that accepts this feature until the rage ends. Until the rage ends, the chosen creatures can each use the following benefits once on each of their turns. Uh, until there is uh, uh, to, to, to use the following benefit. The creature hits a target with an attack roll and deals damage to it. The creature can roll. Can roll. Your power die. And again, at this level. At 14th level, your power die is a D8, which happens to correspond with the damage that it offers, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Oh, no, it's only a D6 there. Haha, uh -huh, fuck you. All right, so we would offer a D8, and then it will eventually, at 17th level, evolve into a D10. So your ally, let's see, uh, roll a number of, uh, to, to roll a number of power dice equal to, uh, yeah. that is not where I'm at. Where am I? Here I am. Uh, when the creature hits with an attack roll and deals damage to it, the creature you can roll. Uh, you can roll. Uh, the creature can roll your power die and gain a bonus to the damage equal to the number rolled. You can use this feature a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus, and you regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. And. If you don't have any uses left as a free action, you can spend two period points to regain one use. When you begin your rage, if you don't have any uses left as a free action, you can spend two fury points to regain one use. You can spend three fury points to regain one use. because it's all allies within 30 feet and it is your power die is escalation. So we want to have it cost more than the two points. Like most, most ranger and artificer features, which you can regain use of by spinning a spell slot basically translates into two spell points using the system that I use of one point per level expended. Sounds like that's, it, this is borrowing off of uh, the, the, the power martial powers is a, is a direct term from fourth edition and, um, whatever people want to say about fourth edition, it's, it's mechanics were pretty cool, but they didn't have a lot of flavor to them. They were very much just like math equations, uh, which I think was off putting to a lot of people having this natural language format actually makes 4e mechanics more palatable to read because they don't read like they, they don't, they don't read like in like. Uh, like like a like a like a menu list like Pathfinder 2 the biggest the biggest problem I have with with Pathfinder 2 character creation is bouncing off of that 200 pages of feats different types of feats and they all just feel the same because they're all formatted with so many tags that it's just like it's like a laundry list of modifiers and tags it's kind of hard to, to 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 sink your imagination into how structured it is 4E was incredibly structured like that. 
which was really great for efficient coding. Like if they had pulled the trigger on the virtual tabletop, like they had originally talked about going for 4E, if they had the technology to be able to build it well back then, then, um, then it, it would have made a lot of sense. But it had that same bounce effect where people just, just it's hard to sink your teeth into it. I, I find anyway, 5E natural language is frustrating as hell to code with because it isn't coding, it's just language. But um, it's a lot more, it, it's, it has its subtleties that you have to pay attention to the prepositional phrases specifically, but you don't have that reflecting, um, you, you don't bounce off of it like you do. Like with 4E stuff is what I'm trying to reiterate. Mojo Jojo style, like over and over again. Fucking kill me. <laughs> yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. And instead of it being like a, like a per use or per encounter or per day power, it's a, it's a mana system. And that mana system is the, uh, is, the, is the same system that we use for all of our color mana spell points that we already have on the DMs Guild, which is free for you to view and encourage to purchase. And the link that I have in my description down below for the color mana spell points, it all uses that same thing. This is part of my grand design to have all 13 classes using the same resource system, mana, that I developed the system for you to make that mana be colored mana. So if you want to play a Boros Barbarian or a Boros Fighter or a Boros Wizard or a Boros Paladin, Warlock, Ranger, it doesn't matter. Whatever class you're choosing, if you're going to be a Boros or if you're going to be Lorehold or if you're going to be um, uh, like a follower of uh, Eros, you're going to be using that white and red mana and all of these classes can then use that same white red mana pool to cast spells or to channel powers and it all curves into the same structure. So from there, if Wizards of the Coast ends up nuking um, the, the DMs Guild or whatever, or if they shut it down or whatever, I have this, I have this stratus in place, the, the scaffold in place that I could just, I could just like go into like Patreon and start punching out like, here's, here's a book of red or here's the book of black or here's the book of white. Hopefully they're gonna leave the DMs Guild open so I can continue doing this shit. And God willing, they're going to do more stuff like Aquaria, Zendikar. Um, you know, uh, I'd love I'd love to see um, uh, Zendikar uh, as well as um, Kaladesh. Like all these things, they all I, I have a system here that all thirteen classes have a unified scaling system from level one to twenty, where mana means the same thing for all the classes. It's been an incredibly heavy lift, but it works. It, like it really, really works. It's just a matter of getting the rest of the classes built out and published so that I can have that full bundle, have all these things working together. And then I can start building little peel out pieces on the DMs Guild if allowed, on my Patreon, otherwise if it's not. So like I could do as in, I could do a book of Zendikar using this stuff and build out like the core and like have core artificers and have like core barbarians and have like core war, K-O-R is, is the race of freedom fighters in, uh, in Zendikar that fight against the Eldrazi for instance. So that's the idea behind it. So it's a pretty heavy lift, but it's been fucking fun. So what we're going to do, oh, there's text. I'll catch up with you in a second. But the next thing that we're going to do is now that we have the features defined and they slid into place pretty easily. Uh, now that we have those in place, we now get to go into our actual power list here and build out the, the level progression. So as we can see up here, like the, uh, the, uh, the ancestral guardian, Third level, you gain two powers. Fifth level, you gain two powers. Ninth level, you gain two powers. Thirteenth level, you gain two powers. Because that's how the power structure works as a half caster. Um, when you pick up your archetype at third level, you get two powers. At fifth level, uh, you get two powers. At ninth level, you get two powers. At thirteenth level, you get two powers. But fourth rank is the maximum rank of powers. So there is no fifth rank of power, but there are five levels of progression as a half caster. So at 17th level, you take the efficient power feat and the efficient power feat allows you to reduce the cost of one of your more expensive powers. Uh, choose a power you've learned of second rank or higher, reduce the rank and amount. It's basically down casting. Basically, I'm really proud of that. Uh, I, I developed this mechanic a good month before they introduced down casting in the Ranger playtest. Um, so, uh, I'm, I'm really, I pat myself on the back about that one a lot. 
So what are we gonna look at here? Uh, gotta say, I'm loving the dice scaling for the power dice that you're implementing. Thank you. Uh, that for some reason have a specific number of dice. Yes. And uh, you know the DM Guild will get it. It, it, it probably will. But in, in, whether the DM Guild gets axed or, well, it will probably get axed. The real question is, is Wizards automatically going to port? Since Wizards is the publisher, Wizards owns all that content. It's their contract with, with uh, one bookshelf that has all those PDFs published on the DMs Guild specifically. But if Wizards is going to kill their relationship with the DMs Guild, there's probably going to be a kill fee that's going to allow them to export all that stuff and drop it into the DMs Guild. That would be our, uh, into, uh, into D&D Beyond, which would be an insane lift of effort. I don't know where it's going to go. But I, even, even if it does get nuked and all of this gets thrown into the wind, everything that's in here is stuff that I can extract and rebuild as my own stuff because the only thing they can copyright is the language. And there's a lot of different ways I could have written all this stuff. I just went with the most Watsy uh, uh, friendly version possible because of the DMs Guild. But I could completely write all of this in a very different way and it would be completely street legal for me to publish it elsewhere. So if they nuke us... That just means I have to go on to my own thing now. It's, I'm just waiting for them to make the decision about that. And I'm okay with that because it's not my day job. I'm just a hobbyist. So we'll see where I end up landing. But, uh, oh, hey, Turn. It's good to see you, my guy. Uh, let's see. Got to say, I'm loving the dice scaling. Thank you. Yeah, the dice scaling is really smooth and it doesn't disrupt anything. It's the, the die is less than, like, say, what a bard is able to provide for inspiring uh, uh, inspiration. Everything inside of this system is designed to be more flexible, but less, uh, but less numerically um, uh, impactful than what standalone options already exist inside of the game. Like a, a paladin using normal smite deals 2d8 damage with a divine smite at second level. Using my system, it's only 2d6. Until you get to ninth level, then it becomes two, it then becomes a D eight, just like the bar, the paladin would have. But at seventeenth level, it becomes a D ten. So it has a different scaling. It's weaker at first. In the middle, somewhere it's the same, and at the very high end, where few people get, it's actually better. But every one of these things has like the binding, binding, uh, like branding smite, um, uh, banishing smite, all those smite effects that we have in here on top of it, which are which are, you know things that you can do. So I got to catch up here real quick. Um, let's see. Uh, why infects is fury. Uh, anything about how tricky it might be illegally, the mana system you built. Yeah, it's not a problem for me. I don't care. If, if the, if the, if Wasi ends up nuking this and continues to ignore my phone calls, you know, cause you guys can, I'm like right the fuck down the street. I'm an easy sell. If you guys ever decide you want to hire white men again, <laughs> I have this whole thing that you can guys use like right the fuck now, but whatever, you know, they, they know their way to go. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, doing a lot of coding for the Vagabond. Yeah, man, absolutely. Uh, oh, shh. <laughs> Fucking A, dude. That's rough. Um, yeah, Watsi uh, kills a license. They're going to have to, uh, you're gonna have a lot of his customers who uh, bought oh, stuff. Yeah, no kidding. We'll, we'll see what they do. I mean, luckily for me, it's, this is just a side gig for me. It's it's just, uh, I, a painter has to paint. So I ended up getting into painting for RPGs because, it, hey, people were willing to pay me for the, for the fantasy artwork that I like to make. And then as the world globalized and the cost of commissions kept dropping and dropping, I had to become more and more specialized as an artist. So I was able to drive up the, the cost of a character art commission to about $400 per character. Uh, but at that level of pedigree, the, the client is very demanding because they're paying a lot of money for the commission that they're building. And I don't blame them for that. But I ended up really hating doing character commissions unless it's for a friend, you know, somebody I really care about because, the, because well, A, a friend's going to be really generous with what I do. But I wanted to adopt a, I'm going to paint whatever the fuck I want. You're just paying for my time. And at a $400 price point, that that wasn't jiving with the community. I was able to drop the cost down to $200 per character for a page of character art my way without you having any real input um, so that it was fun for me. But again, it, it, 
globalization and the challenges of like like people in Indonesia that are have the same level of skill that I have, but one fourth of the living expenses could do the same level of art and the same level of freedom that I was offering for like say seventy five dollars per page instead of two hundred. So I ended up having to get priced out of that. So the only the only backdrop I had at that point was well I can't make the money I want to make now creating art for RPGs. Maybe instead I should make my own RPGs to put art inside of so I'm not being paid directly for the art. I'm being paid for the book, which indirectly is paying for the art, which is a path I can use to eventually get into Kickstarters, where as a Kickstarter, I can build a book from scratch and do all the artwork with it and do the same streaming process we're doing now. But where we're at in the process now is I'm creating the book first and if you guys think it's cool at the back end, maybe someone will buy it. If, if I can build enough of an audience and support that I can flip it to doing Kickstarters, I can say, this is the book that I want to build. I want $10,000 to build it. Who wants it? And if you buy, and if you back me at say the $200 level, you get to be the art director for three pieces of art that's going to go into the book. Tell me what you want and we'll make it work. And I can then, I can then fold in that sort of a Kickstarter process so that I can get the book paid for at the front end. And then all this stream time is with people in chat or people that would presumably be backing the Kickstarter project. Tell me what they think is cool about what they want to see inside the book. So when I get to the page process, like, like, uh, in like in the layouts here that I'm doing for Spelljammer, right? Here's, uh, like, uh, we're talking about, um, like for example, here's a cosmic horror that we've translated into the large scale, 50 foot scale combat system using a cosmic horror and the token art that I did for the cosmic horror is going to fit in this spot here. And then like, uh, the aesthetic, which is another creature I can have fit in another spot. Um, down here, we've got Kandori. I can put a Kandori here. I can put a lunar dragon here. I can put a megapede here, but further up in the document, like, like for instance, um, I have a hole in the page that I need to be filled. Like we're talking about spherical gravity here and we're talking about planets, uh, and we're talking about gravity fields. So if I were to fill, I'm going to put a lot of diagrams in here, but like, if I wanted to have like a, a small spot illustration here and somebody were sponsoring as a patron, that art piece, then it would be like, what kind of characters and ship do you want to have in this illustration? They would tell me what they want. I would build it. And then that's, that's their illustration. So that's kind of the thought process that's going on there. Anyway, I'm really off topic. Let me make sure I catch up and I'll get back on the road. Um, hopefully uh, this new one will calculate way faster. Yeah. Uh, sort of, yeah, JavaScript's a pain in the ass, man. I think the way most TTRPGs are gonna go, it has to be crowdfunding. Uh, a, if, if you've got, if you've got, yeah, if you've got a really good idea that people are back, I mean, it's, it, that's the most, kickstarting really is the best representation of capitalism in the capitalistic system where money has to be given for ideas. Um, if you think the idea is cool and you have faith in the creator, throw them money, they'll build the thing, you get what you paid for. It's pretty straightforward. If you don't like the idea, you don't back the project. Pretty straightforward. But that, uh, the other benefit, again, tuning my own horn here, the, uh, the, the other benefit I have behind building out all this project is that I now have hundreds of hours of content production proving that I can build deep mechanics, not only with this power system, but like, like with, a, with this, the Spelljammer book. Like this is a 106 page document. Um, this Marshall Powers book is gonna end up being like around 55 pages. And the, uh, the Marshall uh, and the, the color mana system bundle, it's 75 pages, 30 pages, 15 pages, 10 pages, eight pages. That's like 118 pages worth of content. So between those things and the, the, the Thurgy ability casting magic, which is 35 pages, I've got about 150 pages, uh, 208 pages, about Three, about 340 pages worth of content that I've proven here that I have mechanical chops to build this shit out and I'm doing all the artwork for it. So once I eventually get enough backers to be able to, to carry me through Kickstarters, obviously um, the risks equals, let's just hope I don't die. You know, <laughs> like the only, risk, the only risk for me building books is basically, am I gonna live long enough to get them done? <laughs> so having said that, let's, uh, let's, 
let's get back to work so I can finish this one before I die too. So, <laughs> so we're looking at Path of the Beast. We want to build out some shit that makes the beast cool. Um, I need to get some more sleep. Hey, right on, Fred. I hope you have a great night, man. Thanks for being here. I really appreciate your support. And looking forward to catching up with you on Thursday. Uh, let's see. So, great. Okay, so we're looking at Path of the Beast, third level. So, uh, a, a character at third level has very little mana. That is a universal problem that we have, especially for the Barbarian, because at third level, the Barbarian literally has only three mana. Now, we know that from how we built Barbarians that you can, when you take a short rest and you burn hit dice to regain hit points, you gain one point of mana. You, you regain a, a point of mana for every hit die that you spend during your healing. So the healing dice now do, double da now do double duty for you. They give you back hit points and they give you back mana. But you have so little mana that it's really it, it, like, it, uh, like a strike. Like if you're going to do like a, a smite that's going to take two of your mana away, that's a, that's a big chunk of your budget that you're now losing. So again, what we do is the options that we have, there's exploits, which is an, an improvised modifier to a, like an ability check roll. You add your power die to the result. Um, or a, smite, a strike power, which is when I deal damage, I'm going to roll my power dice and add up that damage to add to my weapon damage plus whatever the kicker effect is. But then we also have sustained powers, which are I, I tap the mana, I now maintain concentration on that power and while I can maintain focus, that power remains active for however long I want until I take a long rest or I lose, or I, I, I'm incapacitated, lose consciousness, basically. When you go to sleep, things get shut down. Uh, or you can dismiss them at will, of course, but they have, no, they have no duration. So at low levels, my recommendation is to take sustained powers that give you more kick, um, that give you more benefit over time. It's like, it's like a haste spell, for instance. Uh, if you were a fifth level carrot, like, well, in this system, you'd be a half caster. So like at ninth level, if you were able to turn on and keep haste on for the entire day, and that costs you three mana to do it. And at ninth level, I only have nine mana, like a barbarian spending three mana to permanize haste for themselves for the day is worth a third of their power budget. Like that's worth it. So we built all the sustained powers to kind of reflect that relationship. But beyond that, you can also spend a power instead of gaining a, a mana costing power, you can take feats and you can get up to 16 feats. Instead, you can completely ignore your mana pool altogether. Fuck it, I don't want mana. I don't wanna bother with the complexity of mana, but I would love to have a 16 extra feats. So when 1D and D gets finalized, undoubtedly I'm sure all these weapon masteries will be options. Obviously we'll be able to just fold weapon mastery as a feat option you can pick any of those eight features to pick up as a weapon mastery as your weapon cantrips that curves really gracefully into this power system overall. It's everything that they're doing with marshals right now in the in the D&D playtesting is fucking gorgeous to me because A, I've already predicted almost all the big moves that they made. Downcasting, getting spellcasting at first level, building out the, uh, uh, building out the progression of things, having more powers leaning and uh, having more spells leaning into ways that they're expressing what those classes can do. These are all things that we had already anticipated months ahead of their playtesting. So obviously my head's in the right space for this place. So that probably means that we're gonna have options for feats to be able, just to be able to pick up weapon masteries. So once we do that, we'll have any of these martial characters be able to just naturally pick up any weapon master they want as a cantrip that they can use with their attack. If you don't want to like say, uh, use a thundering strike to push your enemy 10 feet per mana spent. You just have the generic push power, whatever whatever the fuck it is that they call it, push. Whatever, you hit someone with a hammer and you push them 10 feet, that's it. That's a, that's a cantrip. It was a zero cost thing, there you go. But if you pour mana on top of it, you're dealing extra damage and you can push them an extra 10 feet. So you can use the cantrip and then we just modify it so that if you're using the, uh, the, the masteries, when you use the thundering strike, it adds an additional 10 feet to your push. So if you use push plus thundering strike for one mana, it'd be 20 feet instead of just 10. So all this stuff is really elegant and curves nicely. So I guess it's just gonna be a matter of where do I get to publish it? But this will publish before then. So we're working on third level where you have virtually no mana. 
So as you can see from the Battle Rager and from the, uh, from the Ancestral Guardian, we're leaning into the sustained powers and feats. And here in the Battle Ranger, we have a feat. And we chose a strike here, but only because it was really natural for the, the, the style of characters grappling. Uh, so now that we're working on the beast, we're going to probably pick up a feast and sustain power. Let's see what we can get. Uh, a fighter with 20 more feats. <laughs> right, I know, right? But then you can use all of your like your your 5th, 6th, 8th, 12th, 16th, and 19th level feats to actually gain stats. To push your strength up, to push your dex up, to push your wisdom up. The things that you actually, your constitution, you have those four stats that you need to feed as a fighter, dexterity maybe, maybe not, but it's one of the core, like dexterity, wisdom, and constitution are your saving throw core. So you wanna push those ASIs up as much as you can, plus your strength because fighter. So you want all those, all those feats on your character tree going to ASI as much as possible. So using the power system for feats instead, they're all good feats. 5e did away with, for the most part, crappy feats. So you're gonna get good stuff. So let's see what's some good what's some good fun to uh, to go with as a beast character. Is there anything jumping out at us that is immediately going to say? Well, I bet Savage Attack is gonna make sense. I don't remember how Savage Attack is though. So let's go to D and D Beyond, and let's go to. Savage Attack. Let's remember what Savage Attack is. Maybe it's Savage Attacker? Thank you. Once per turn, when you roll damage for a melee weapon, you can re-roll the, the weapon's damage dice and use either total. That also, by the way, counts for the power dice that you roll. So if I were to throw 3d8 on top of my, say, claw attack, which is doing a d8, if I put three man into it, do 48 damage, and then have like lifelink attached to it, so I get 3d8 temporary hit points on top of it, I could, using, uh, using the Savage Attacker, I could re-roll all four of those dice uh, and, and use whichever total is better. So that's, that's actually pretty fucking good. Um, Alert might actually be a good one too. Let's look at, I think, I bet Alert is gonna fit the flavor. Savage Attacker is like one of those feats that you, know, like, you may not ever like choose to take, but if I give it to you for free, it's like, yeah, okay. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's useful. Let's see about, maybe Alert, but Savage Attacker. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, I know what I need to do. Savage Attacker is a feat. Comma. What we need is lycanthrope. Uh, you can tell quite a lot of cutting room floor stuff for Marshall's cut shoved over feet. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, let's go to the sustained powers. So when we uh, this this project, the core the 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 origins of this project was, I hate blood hunter cutting yourself to gain power. I don't like that narrative at all. So what I wanted to do was. Uh, rebuild all the rights and curses and stuff and all the subclass options from the blood hunter into alternate ranger options which kind of meant that they needed to be codified as spells so that created the path to power as it were and so i then translated all of the blood hunter options into level equivalent things that then got basically dumped into a list like this and then we just kind of kept going and going and going and going. And at this point we have 140 of them, plus the feats, plus the damage modifiers. So this is, it's like, like alternate spells. There's 140 of them broken into exploits, uh, maneuvers, reactions, strikes, and sustained powers. So uh, I am going to specifically, since we're talking about the beast and the beast talks about lycanthropy, uh, borrowing from the, uh, from the blood hunter, let's go into our sustained powers and look at one of the blood hunter modified, which is lycanthropy, bitches. 
Lycanthropy, while sustaining this power, now again, this is a first rank power. So you can do it at as early as first level, but at third level as a barbarian, you're gonna get it for free because it's gonna be part of your power stack. So what does Lycanthropy do? Uh, while sustaining this power, you can shift form into a Lycanthrope creature, gaining the following benefits. Heightened senses. You gain advantage on wisdom, perception, and investigation checks. Feral might. You gain advantage on strength checks. Natural weapons. Gain unarmed attacks that deal one power die plus your strength or dexterity modifier, slashing or piercing damage. There you go. Pretty simple. We already, from Form of the Beast, we already get a bite, claw, or tail that we just translated into dealing one power die of damage when you hit with an attack, and they have these kicker effects. So you don't necessarily need Lycanthropy to, get, to use Form of the Beast, but if you chose to sustain this, then you would gain the advantage on the Wisdom and the Strength checks for Perception. That's actually pretty good value. I would say it's pretty good value. For a one mana sustained power, it's kind of like, it's it's like a, um, um, how to put it, like um, the word I'm looking for is borrowed knowledge. Thank you. Borrowed knowledge gives you a, um, uh, a plus two bonus to any skill check that you choose. This is advantage, which is technically a plus five. So this sits somewhere between the um, the word I'm looking for. Fucking A, what's that spell that gives you the stealth bonus, the plus 10 stealth bonus? Why am I blanking on that? Um, anyway, that's a second level spell, which is a plus 10 bonus. And the, uh, and the, uh, the borrowed knowledge is a plus two bonus to a specific skill. Uh, this is advantage, which is a plus five to a stack of stuff. So, but it's a sustained power. The, uh, the borrowed knowledge is a, like a one hour, no concentration effect. Uh, pass without trace. Thank you kindly, sir. Yeah, so that's a concentration effect that affects people within an area. It gives you a plus 10 bonus. This is advantage to yourself only for one mana. So, and again, using the, the sustained powers, you can either maintain concentration on it and potentially lose it. But a barbarian, when they rage, they can't concentrate. So it forces the power to lock. And again, for those that aren't initiated, the difference between sustained powers and locked powers is when you lock mana, it drops your maximum channel level by the amount of mana locked. If you are a third level, if you are a, if you are a ninth level character that can channel up to third rank powers, channeling three mana at a time, and you decided to lock Lycanthropy, uh, it would drop the amount of mana that you can channel and the maximum power that you could channel down to two. You would normally have three, but you've just locked one of the mana. You're now down reduced to two, but you no longer have to maintain concentration on the power. So sticking with that idea about limiting mana, you could potentially lock all of your channels up with sustained powers to maintain haste, lycanthropy, and like say wall running, all, all locking all of your mana down. So you can't use mana at all, but no one can take away those powers from you unless they target you with a dispel magic effect. So. There's that, that's, that's the fun little compromise. So you could build out a kit of, you could build out your character's kit to have nothing but feats and five ranks worth of sustained powers. And you could build your character to do the exact kind of action loop that you want them to do reliably all day without having to use any more mana than just what you use in your battery to turn these things on and lock them down. But characters that like to fiddle and fuck with shit, they can either leave those channels open to have to force the concentration saves and potentially have to re to, to rechannel the ability if it gets disrupted. Um, or you can like devote into per use things like exploits, maneuvers, and strikes and reactions. So, but Lycanthropy I think is a no brainer uh, at third level for this type of character because it is after all Path of the Beast. And Lycanthropy gives you that added value of the feral senses and the feral strength. So that is a sus. It is not sus, it is just sus sustained power. So fifth rank, or uh, at fifth level, we gain second rank powers, right? So let's see what we get at sixth level, which is just after gaining, well, we didn't have any changes to Beastial Souls. So what, what did that thing do? This should help us inform what kind of stuff we should get for free at fifth level. So Beastial, oh, that's right. It gives you climbing, jumping, and swimming options. So we have cool shit that gives you bonuses like that. Uh, let's see what we can lean into to make them even better. We'll start at second rank and then work our way back to the first. 
Uh, Cloud Strider, when uh, when this power is sustained, you can fly using your walking speed. If you end your turn in the air, or if this power is disrupted, you gain the benefits of a Featherfall spell. So, limited flight. Um, eh, that's a little bit more than what I think is, is the flavor for, uh, for the beast. Um, let's see. Strange Metabolism. When sustaining this power, you're immune to poison damage and the poison condition. In addition, as a bonus action, you can make an unarmed attack that deals one power die of poison damage and the creature must make a constitution saving throw or be poisoned until it succeeds constitution saving throw at the end of each of its turns. Nah, it could work. It could work. I don't think it's, I don't think it's what we'd really want. Sturdy. Gain advantage on constitution and check saving throws. Uh, sorry, not, uh, not saving throws, checks. That's a pretty good one. That's a second rank power though. That's gonna eat two of your five power budget to do that. Unnatural resistance, we don't have to worry about that. Well, actually, unnatural resistance is pretty fucking useful for like Path of the Bear. Like Path of the Bear gets this for free when you rage, but no one else does. So I'm gonna pay two mana for it. It's not horrible. Weapon resistance as well. You don't, you don't need that ever because just basic barbarian rage gives you the resistance to this stuff, but no one else does. So it's gonna be expensive for them to gain it, but they can. So I'm not seeing anything here that's jumping out at me as beast specifically. What was astute? No, nope, that's intelligence wisdom. That is very not. Mm, deadly presence. These things are cool, but they don't smell like beast specifically. Let's see first rank powers so that we can sustain. Range assault, power shield, omnilinguists. We already have lycanthrope. Inspired skill. While sustaining this power, you gain proficiency in a skill or tool of your choice. You can channel this power more than once and simultaneously, gaining different skills. Fast isn't horrible, but you're already gaining speed as a barbarian naturally, so that seems kind of like a waste. Elemental resistance, sure. Dire impact. When you sustain this power, weapon attacks are magic. We already gained that for free at sixth, so we don't have to worry about that. Uh, Cliff runner, we already gained with the, with the climb with the climb feature here. Climbing, you gain the climbing speed equal to your walking speed. You can climb difficult surfaces, including upside down on ceilings without needing to make an ability check. Um, the, uh, the cliff runner is more like the monk where you have your walking speed and climbing. You don't have to use your hands while you do it. So you can remain armed. <sighs> Blind sense isn't a horrible idea for Path of the Beast. Beast, I always think pack tactics in some way. Fair enough. Okay. So let's uh, let's dip down uh, into pack tactics. Second rank maneuver. When you channel this maneuver, uh, target a creature you can see. Other creatures gain advantage to hit that target until the beginning of your next turn. So yeah, I'm I'm super down with that. Let's make that so. And that is a maneuver. Maneuvers, uh, when, you, uh, when you channel maneuver, it's either an action or a bonus action, your choice. Which means that you could, um, packed, <laughs> wrong one, Kearney, pack tactics. I could technically channel pack tactics twice in the same round, choosing two different targets, giving your whole team advantage to both of them if I wanted to, if I wanted to spend more, uh, if I wanted to spend four mana doing that. But once I gain efficient power at 17th level or at any point when I gain a feat, I could pick up efficient power and efficient power allows you to downcast that power by one. So the second rank pack tactics can become first rank. So it only costs one mana for me to be able to do that. But it is an expensive thing to use. So like that's one of those, a lot of these things are expensive for bar barbarians or fighters or rogues. They're all expensive for those guys. But that's not their bread and butter. So, uh, but I like that. Pack Tactics makes a lot of sense for that. Uh, let's see. Mobility isn't a bad option. And it's only one rank to use it. Uh, Brand of Axiom. Uh, I don't like that right off the cuff. Curse, curse, curse. Distract, flatten, goad. Healing Radiance. Restraining Hold. Swift Resuscitation. You can stabilize a dying creature with a touch. Me. Vanish, you become visible for a turn. Bleh. Let's see, um, that was pack tactics at two. Let's see if there's another. 
Let's see if there is a exploit that I like at second rank or, or less. Cooperative effort when using a help action to grant advantage to the ability check or attack of an ally within 30 feet of you. Roll one power die per mana channel, adding the highest result to the ally's die roll. That's uh, I fucking love that one, by the way. That's great. The, uh, the, what I love about uh, the dice system is if I were to like say put four mana into a bunch of d8s, like four four mana equals four eight-sided dice, roll all that. If I were to add all that up, it would completely blow bounded accuracy out of the water. But this system, you would only use the best result of the dice rolled. So if I roll four eight-sided die, the chances of me rolling above a five is very high. But I had to spend four mana to gain that probability. I could just spend one mana, or in this case, two mana, and, and have a likelihood of rolling a four, basically a 50-50 chance of having a pretty good result off of that D8. But this allows you to like, well, I, I don't wanna spend five mana on this because I'm not gonna get up to 40 bonus. I'm only gonna get at best a plus eight. So you keep the bounded accuracy in place, but you're basically paying for probabilities. So that's that's a fun thing that I, I, I just, I, I wanted to point that out because it's a, it's a difference. Like smite stuff, you add up all the dice as damage. But for modifiers to a d20 die roll, you only take the best result out of all the dice that you throw. Uh, natural Hunter. Uh, when making an ability check that can use an investigation, nature, or survival, roll one power die per mana channeled, adding the highest uh, res- roll to uh, your results. And there's two periods there. I don't need that many. But that's basically, that, that's basically the equivalent of giving yourself inspiration, right? But your inspiration die is always trailing one behind with the bard. Like the bard is going to do like D6, D8, D10, D12. I'm going to do D6, D8, D10 eventually. So it's, it's the, the bard's inspiration is always useful. Even if using this power, I can just be a little self-reliant on my own inspiration. It's just not going to be as good as what the bard offers. Um, let's see. I'm, I'm kind of down with natural hunter. See if there's anything else that's grabbing my attention. Ambush isn't mm, ambush isn't so much like a, a feral thing. I think I think natural hunter is probably flavor wise really fucking great choice. So let's go natural hunter. That's an exploit. Ninth level. What do we get at tenth level? What does Beast get at 10th level? And let's modify from there. So, Infectious Fury. When you hit a creature with your natural weapon attack while you're raging the Beast within, you can curse the target with Rapid Fury. The target must make a saving throw or uh, the target must use its reaction to make a melee attack against another target, uh, against another creature of your choice that you can see. Or you can roll a number of power dice equal to the max rank gained as Barbarian. The target takes psychic damage equal to the result of that roll. So in that ninth, at tenth level, that'd be three dice d8. That's three d8, which is equal to like, well, like Alan was saying, it's two d12 out of the book. I don't know why they chose two d12. That's a fucking mystery to me. But it just happens that the three d8 equals the same maximum value. So that kind of that kind of parses out. Um, let's see. So this is a goading, like a like a redirect effect or a psychic damage effect. So what might we want to do with that? We're up to third rank, so we can look at our third rank powers as options. So as usual, we'll start with, we will start, well, we have exploit, we have a maneuver, and we have sustained powers. So we should probably pick up a strike and a reaction at some point around here. So let's see if there's any cool, let's look at reactions first. Let's see if there's any cool reactions that fit into place here. Uh, no, not so much. Defensive barrier creates a, creates a, an obstacle to protect you from damage. Countering attack dispels, spe- basically make an attack roll to dispel magic. Uh, anchor prevents people from teleporting or moving, which there's not, obviously, I mean, there's not a lot. There, there's not a lot of reactions that <laughs> at ninth level for characters to take currently, but that's what expansion books are for. Um, let's see. So that's the reactions at third. I'm not digging them. What do we have at second rank as reactions that we might like? As a reaction to rolling an ability check, but before determining success, you can re-roll the d20 and take the higher result. Nah. 
one's own luck. As a reaction to rolling one or more power dice, you can re-roll any number of dice, take the highest result. We already got that from Savage Attacker. Thank you very much. Moving target as a reaction to when a, tar- a creature you can see moves within while within reach of your melee attack. You can make an opportunity attack even if the target is using a disengage action, rolling one power die per mana, adding the highest result to your attack roll. So that's that's for really good close hand sniping, but doesn't feel very beast specifically. Uh, Curse of the Fallen Puppet raises something. That's a very demure effect, but not beast. So let's see. Is there any reactions, first rank reactions that we like? Let's see. Punish as a reaction to an enemy you can see within range of your weapon attack misses an attack roll against you or an ally. You can make an opportunity attack, adding one power die to the attack roll. Uh, we specifically call opportunity attacks as as what kind of attack you're making because we have uh, we have uh, options that exploit opportunity attacks. So if that's a that's a a, a, a tag, like a, a coding tag, that makes a difference depending on what we're doing, as opposed to just a reaction in general. They're different. Uh, lightning reflexes, iron will, great fortitude, no, interpose, no, faint. As a reaction to when you miss an attack roll, you can roll again, potentially turning the attack into uh, the miss into a hit. That's a first rank power. That's not horrible. Downtrotting, uh, as a reaction to when an enemy you can see within range of your weapon attack becomes prone, you can make an attack at advantage. You can make an, op- that should be make an opportunity attack. Add advantage and add one power die to the attack roll. But that's not specifically, that's a great control power, but not necessarily a, a beast. Curse of exposure, controlled fall. Yeah, I'm not feeling it. As a reaction, a creature within 30 feet of you taking damage if the creature is resistant to the damage, it can't benefit from resistance of the damage rolled. Alternatively, if it's immune to the damage, it is instead only resistant. So, controlled fall might not be a bad one. It's not a great pick. For ninth level, but it's but it I mean it's not off brand. Let's look at some of this shit. Double strike isn't bad. Attacking the prone creature would already have advantage, right? Does it? You're probably right. As a reaction to an enemy can see the range of attack, opportunity becomes prone, you make an opportunity attack. Oh yeah, you're right. Opportunity attack. You can make an opportunity attack and add one power die to an attack roll. Thank you. Still work in progress. Uh, let's see. Parallel. That's 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 over rank. TK double strike. Eh, lift shunt. Uh, regeneration when you ch- eh, regeneration for the beast. Not quite. Curse brand. Mobility, Rally, Healing Radiance, Goad. Now Mobility might not be horrible. Coordinated Attack. Beast. Force them to attack the target that you want. Uh, Let's see. You can empower a target ally within 30 feet to use their reaction to make an attack. Rolling a power die per mana channeled. Uh, adding the highest result to the allies attack against the target you and your allies can both see. <laughs> ah, fuck it. Let's go with hypersonistic. So hypertonistic is when you make an opportunity attack, you can attack the same creature twice. I think that feels pretty good. And that is one. Maybe there's a feat that we want to pick up. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. 
Feats should probably come before damage types. Really, because there's a lot more language going on with damage types because of all the color and the elemental mana coding that goes along with it. Uh, let's see. Efficient power, fighting style, keen weapon, keen mind, linguistic, mobile. Alert, canalize, chef. I need to remind myself, what does mobile do? Mobile. You gain the following benefits. Your speed increases by 10 when you use the dash action. Difficult terrain doesn't cost you extra movement on that. Nah, not feeling that. Let's go to, I think, at this point. Let's go with Rogue Stance. At this point, I think Rogue Stance makes sense for the beast. As a bonus action, it's, uh, it's a first rank, uh, it's a first rank sustained power. At ninth level, you have up to three mana. If you, if you lock both Lycanthrope and Rogue Stance, that takes two of your three mana. You still have a point of mana open that we can use almost all of this stuff with. So let's go with Rogue Stance. Let's go with Sus One. And 13th. Let's see what's the what's the goodies we get. 14th level. Is called the hunt. The beast within you grows so powerful that you can spread for. Oh, okay. That the yeah, yeah. allies gain bonuses to hit. Okay, that's basically like a that's basically like a, a group coordinated attack. So don't need that one, but it is third. It is fourth rank powers, which is the maximum rank of power that we offer. So let's go check out the high end shit and see what cool stuff we got going on. Frenzy. Frenzy is gonna obviously be for the berserker, which will which we'll build out next time. Um, haste, giant growth, fucking hey, giant growth is pretty cool. Flurry attack, there's so much, there's so much added value weapon stuff that you can do with this, it's so freaking great. Uh, giant, like you can take flurry, so like, okay, so flurry attacks a third rank power, right? And, then, and while you're sustaining this as bonus, it's basically, it's basically monk's flurry blows, but it's a sustained power. So it costs you three mana to trigger it. And while it's active, you can make two attacks with your bonus action. And then you've got frenzy, which is, uh, you gain one additional attack when you take the attack action and you gain advantage on all attack rolls. So that costs four. That's a that is ridiculously expensive, but the uh, but the efficient power again. Uh, you can choose a power that you know, and you can reduce its cost by one. You can reduce its rank by one, and reduce the cost by one. It also reduces the amount of dice that you roll if it's a die rolling uh, power. But if you take uh, if you take both efficient powers for both frenzy uh, as as well as flurry attack, flurry of attack drops to two, and frenzy drops to three, which is a total of five. So at 17th level, if you wanted to lock both of those things, you would have, as a barbarian, you would have three attacks from Frenzy for your normal attack. And then your bonus attack, anytime you use it, you get two attacks as well. So you could have up to five attacks, but you had to lock all of your channels and you can't do anything with your mana then. So if you have those two powers, you could then take the rest of your 14 powers and switch them all to feats. <laughs> switch them all to feats so you don't have to worry about expending power. Um, it's just, it, it's, I, I don't know if that's actually a good build or not, but, uh, but it's certainly a lot of, it's certainly a lot of attack power. It's, it's a lot of attacks. I'll give you that. It's not like you can actually boost the damage at all, 
because you can't channel any strikes because all your panel all your channels are locked but it's still fun uh, let's see what other fourth rank stuff is there anything here that specifically screams beast paralyzing banishing strikes not so much um, as reaction when you drop to zero hit point ah! Conscious and roll a number of power dice equal to your mana burn, gaining that many hit points instead, up to the maximum hit point. Mm. Right of revival. That that feels like a like a juggernauty, tanky sort of thing. But I don't think that specific. Maybe right of revival is a maybe. We'll we'll pencil that in as a possible. It doesn't feel like the right solution, but right of revival. Uh, react. Four. Let's see what else we got. Incapacitator while grappling. Eh, beast isn't much of a of a grappler. Paralyzed. Not that's that's a little too esoteric. Assassinate, unstoppable. Nah, neither one of those feels specifically. All right, well, maybe we're just building this guy on the cheap. So let's see. What in here is cool? Use a bonus action to channel a maneuver. You can make a weapon attack as part of the bonus action. This attack can be made at the beginning, end, or during the empowered maneuver. It's expensive. I'm gonna skip that one. Let's uh, let's go. Let's just look at some strikes. We haven't picked up any strikes yet. It doesn't really matter what the what the rank is. It's just we don't have any, so we should probably grab some. Uh, let's see. Uh, tripping strike when you when uh, your weapon deals increase one power die per mana burned and you can knock a creature up to two sizes larger than you or smaller prone. The target makes a strength saving throw to prevent this, adding the highest power die result to your channeling DC. Yeah, that's it's, 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 it's a wolfy sort of thing. Oh, 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 that's that's it. Um, it was uh, the life stealing strike. That's that's actually precedented by the bite. So that's, that's what we should have in here for sure. Uh, Life stealing strike. R3. Uh, your weapon damage increases by one power die per mana burned. In addition, you gain a number of temporary hit points equal to the result of the power dice rolled. Any temporary hit points that uh, remain when you start a short or long rest are lost. It's temporary hit points. Um, you could do it over and over again, but it's only going to refresh up to or more than the, it, it has to equal or exceed the amount of hit points that even matter. Um, technically exceed, not even equal. So yeah, that, but you've got, but you have that lifesteal effect already in the bite that you have from all the way or as early as first level. So that's really cool. But we got around to dumping more onto it. Like it, that does one power die of damage, like a D8 you'd get up to D8 temporary hit points as a result of doing that. And it's every time you bite, that's great. But the lifesteal lets me dump mana in on top of it to not only deal extra damage, but to also really boost up the amount of temporary hit points that I gain. So I only have to maybe use it every other round or so, uh, depending on what I'm doing. The, 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 the bite that gives you the temporary hit points is actually a really great ability in the Barbarian. Uh, where is that? The uh, form of the beast, the bite. You know, your mouth transforms as a bite once uh, oh, it's once on each of your turns. Uh, when you damage a creature with this bite, you regain a number of hit points. Uh, this is actually healing your hit points. That's a big difference. So you regain a number of hit points equal to the result of the power die, which is going to be a D6 and eventually up to a D10. Uh, but the life stealing specifically is giving you a temporary hit point buffer. So I'm, I'm, I'm really content with that. And then ah, blind sense isn't bad. It's not awesome though.
Rain's Assault, Rogue Stance, Trap Springer, Astute, Auto Attunement, Castigate, Class Strider, Deadly Presence, Mind Sense, Opportunist. Quick. No. Um. What do we want? Go with um, you can crawl and stand from prone without requiring additional movement. Attack rolls made against you while prone by creatures within five feet don't have advantage. Attack rolls you make while prone don't have disadvantage, and you gain advantage on dexterity stealth checks while prone. It's uh, it feels eh, it feels kind of beastie. I mean, it's thematic, and so is aquatic adaption. That's that's very beast. And you know what? Honestly, aquatic adaption. I think that's a winner. Aquatic adaption. Uh, while sustaining this power, you can breathe water and gain swim speed equal to double your walking speed. In addition, you have no penalties to melee attack rolls from attacking underwater. So we're gonna shuffle some stuff around. Let's uh, let's push. Let's push hypertonistic to thirteen. Let's push pack tactics to nine. Let's go with the way the, the way that we have this set up is that you, um, whenever you gain a level, you can swatch out, you can swap out your entire kit. So like you could like at third, four, like at fourth level, you could take Natural Hunter, but then at fifth level you get it for free. So you drop Natural Hunter and anything else that you want, and then swap it out for something different. So now we have our kit build out. There's a lot of cheap shit in here. Efficient power, pack tactics. That drops it to one. And uh, let's go with, um, I don't know, what do, we, we, what do we want to drop the cost to? Hypergenistic or Life Stealing Strike? I think Life Stealing Strike is going to have more value. So let's drop that to two. It'll only be two dice that you roll with the two, but you could always do it up to five. There. And that finishes the beast. Hour and 43 minutes. Oy vey, these things take a while. <laughs> yeah, so far so good. I mean, that's that's the beast. I, I would say, I mean, any of these, even the fucking battle rager becomes really fucking cool when you stack on 16 feet or whatever onto it. Like, it's hard to, it, it's hard to have a bad pick when you have a shitload of added value. Kind of like a, the wizard. Like, there is no bad wizard. There is no bad bad sorcerer there is no bad druid they have spells they have like 20 spells they can pick to customize their action loop each day like they're not bad like compared to a monk 
none of them are bad. It just becomes relative. Like this is the strongest wizard as opposed to that wizard. So when you add in a whole power system like this, like none of these things are bad. Uh, they get some they they get some features that that kick them up and then they also get the added power list so any of them are good because they're giving you like anywhere from eight to 16 extra things you could do beyond what the barbarian would normally be able to do on top of the full stack of powers that you have like people talk about the divide between casters and marshals and fucking this is it like this this ability to customize how your character complements and, and synergizes with your team by the options that they pick just simply are absent from Marshalls, which it should be no news flash to anybody. But there's a lot, I mean, this is obviously a, a heavy mechanical dive to one of many possible solutions. But in my mind, the largest problem that you have with casters being, you know, quadratic versus linear progression is because they have the ability to build their action loops and their and how they help the team very specifically with what features slash spells they choose to know. And this is allowing you that same depth of verisimilitude to, to basically decide what kind uh, what kind of role are you going to play with your team. Like we really let's 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 get it let's get into the rogue. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna skip the arcane archer for now because it comes with a lot of options that quite frankly are going to be a pain in the ass right now to parse through. But uh, but I don't it's I have a day off. I can spend another hour on this. So let's let's spend a little bit of time on the rogue to, to talk about exploits and shit. Right? So can I become huge. <laughs> Yes, it can become huge. <laughs> so yes, it is super fucking cool. Uh, like a like a fifteen foot tall dwarf giving you the hug of doom. That's that. Yeah, that's pretty fucking sweet. So, <laughs> so the martial trickster, right? That is the uh, that is the class that we built specifically for this. Um, it it has the same it has the same power options basically as as the barbarian does. You can use either your intelligence or your dexterity uh, as your um, as your um, uh, as you're channeling stat for your like spelt like your DCs and and like power rules and stuff like that. Um, so here's just here's the the quick layout of how the rogue works. So you have empowered sneak attacks, which is at third level when you deal sneak attack damage, you can reduce your sneak attack damage by two dice, which are d6s again, and instead gain a point of temporary mana to spend on the strike power you know. So basically, you give up two sneak attack dice and you gain one free point of mana that you spend on the strike power. That's gonna be a shitty return of investment initially because that first level is only a D6 that you're rolling on damage, right? But you're gaining all the things that strikes do. Like at first level as a strike, I could I could do my 2D6 sneak attack. Like, sorry, that'd be third level, Jesus. So yeah, when you pick this up at third level, you have 2D6 sneak attack dice or if you give up your sneak attack dice, you get one D6 damage and one of these effects. And uh, my favorite go-to is uh is free is um uh is uh shocking strike which is um shocking grass basically you deal lightning damage you'll deal that extra power die of damage which is a d6 and the creature can't take reactions until the end of their next turn it's like if you want to if you want to take out a wizard like if you want to be a mage killer you take shocking strike so he can't counter you ever just keep disrupting his um his react like take away his reactions all the time he can never counter you so that's an easy way to do it um, the other real, the, the other great standout is uh, goading strike, which is you deal. In this case, it'd be a D6 damage, and the creature you strike has disadvantage on any attack made that doesn't target you. This effect ends if the target hits you. It can also attempt to end this effect at the end of each of its turns by succeeding an intelligence saving throw. So, like a rogue could take goading strike, move in, stick you with the sneak attack, and then use cunning action to get behind the fighter. Uh, the fighter uses Sentinel, so now that target, if it doesn't attack the rogue who's hiding behind the Sentinel, is going to have disadvantage on all attacks. What's he going to do? He's going to close distance, try to make an attack. Sentinel's going to shut him down, and then he's fighting the fighter at a disadvantage already. So that's those, those are fun examples. Like I would lose a D6 of damage to trigger no reactions this round. Or like Thundering Strike I mentioned before. Um, for each mana I spend on this, 
not only am I dealing an extra die of damage, but I'm also pushing my target up to 10 feet. Maximum da- max mana is five. Max distance is 50 feet. Like those are really useful. Tripping strike, that's a thing. Uh, freezing attack reduces your speed by in half. So like a rogue sneak attack drops their speed to 15 feet per round. I just use cunning action. You're a melee only creature. Sorry, if you have the ability to close distance with me, you're now stuck in front of me. I'm going to sneak attack you again and keep and keep um, 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 pacing, kiting. I'm going to keep kiting you because I, I'm slowing your movement down. Useful stuff. So that's what empowered sneak attack is. And by the time you get up to 15th, uh, by the time you get to 15th level, where you have 10 dice. Uh, sorry, uh, at 19th level, you have 10 dice. You can cash all of your sneak attack dice in and get five free points of mana that I could then like put 5d10, right? So it's uh, it's 10d6, does up to 60 damage as a sneak attack. But instead of I cash all that in, I would be doing 5d10 damage, which is at most 50 damage, but I get this kicker effect on top of it. So like as a rogue, it would be completely worth it for me to pick up, say, Paralyzing Strike or Banishing Strike. Like, I hit you, you go away. Or I hit you and I just pressure, I just pressure, I just pressure pointed you and you can't move now. <laughs> these are, these are really fucking useful things for a rogue. Makes rogues super dangerous. But again, it's, it's using the sneak attack action economy and, and, um, and it can't outscale the damage. It's always a little less damage, but there's more utility involved with it, which is something super useful for a rogue to be more than just a rogue in your party. Uh, he now becomes a, a debuff machine, for instance. So, uh, power over precision. This exploits dice another way. At ninth level, you can temporarily reduce your sneak attack dice for additional mana. We can already do that, right? But as a bonus action, you can sacrifice one sneak attack die to regain one spent mana. For each die, sacrifice this way up to the total sneak attack dice. When you finish a short or long rest, you regain the sacrifice dice and any temporary gained are lost this way. So if I'm 20th level as a rogue, I take a, I'm I'm going to not get, I don't plan on being in a fight during our downtime activity. I want to use all my mana to really push up my skill powers. So I'm going to cash in all of my sneak attack dice and get an extra 10 mana. Uh, to uh, to be able to use on exploits specifically. So you can switch your character from being combat focused now to being social or exploration pillar focused to really lean into what the rogue does best, which is make ability check rolls. Um, so we'll see that here in a moment. Um, Swift Pounce, 13th level. Whenever you use a bonus action to channel a sustained power, you can teleport up to 10 feet per mana sustained to a location you can see and make an attack with an advantage, uh, with advantage immediately after teleporting. So if I decide to activate a sustained power, I can then teleport in, make an attack with an advantage. Uh, and then at 17th level, reliable power at 17th level, whenever I roll a power die triggered by using an ability check that results in five or less, the die roll results instead a six. So at, and at, 10th, at 17th level, I'm rolling a D10. So uh, whenever I roll a D10 on a power die to affect an ability modifier, if the result is five or less, it, instead it's treated as a six. So that creates stable dice. Uh, again, a very roguelike feature uh, that leans into them the exploration pillar of making skill checks. So that's that's how the that's how the rogue works. That's the that's the uh, the martial trickster class specifically designed to lean into the mechanics of martial powers. Like I am a martial power rogue, period. I'm gonna use martial trickster. I'm gonna gain all this manipulation stuff to fuck around with my mana pool and how I use stuff. But if we are instead, and we have monk stuff, but we're now going into, like we're gonna do assassin. So the assassin is an alternate list. So we're gonna go with barbarian archetypes. We'll grab that, we'll copy, and then we'll drop down here into the rogue. And like I said, we're gonna do this for all of these eventually. Um, at least one a week. 
And then uh, once uh, once Spelljammer publishes and we start doing uh, Eberron design six days a week in the mornings, Monday through Saturday, that means that in the evenings on Mondays and Thursdays, right now we're doing Eberron stuff. But once Spelljammer clears out, that pushes Eberron to my morning slot, which means that Marshall Powers will drop into our evening slot. So on Mondays and Thursday nights each week, we'll be doing this. So we'll be increasing the amount of time that we spend on building this stuff out to the point where we start uh, modified archetypes. And then we'll pick a new project for our Tuesday creator stream. Um, we'll go with ass ass in. Since these are since these power lists are things that you always get, I'm trying to lean into things that folks may or may not normally want to choose for themselves, but they get. So since they have them, it occasionally becomes useful. Like that savage attacker, for instance. That's a great example of it. Uh, features equals blip. So let's go look at the assassin, shall we? Ass, ass in. Yeah, we were skipping Arcane Trickster uh, specifically because that is a modified use of power that blends spellcasting and powers together, which gets treated separately. Uh, so let us look and see at what we get to be. Disguise and Poisoner's Kit. No changes. <clears throat> ass, ass, and eight. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I accidentally name a power the same thing as this feature? I need to fix that. Where'd he go? Where you at? Pinner Brothers Jolly Baseball Bat. Come on, baby. Where are you? I know you're in here somewhere, buddy. Yeah, I can't have that be the same name. Uh, assassination. There you go. My, my solution to assassination as a very high level power is when you deal damage with a weapon attack to a target that has yet to act in combat or is unaware of your attack, you automatically deal maximum damage, uh, including any additional damage dice such as sneak attack or when channeling a strike power. It costs four mana as an exploit, so I make the attack, I hit, I'm going to deal damage, I throw four mana at it, and I automatically deal maximum damage. There's zero, there's literally nothing in this entire manual that modifies critical, mo uh, that modifies um, your chance to crit. Um, I, I am not a fan of paying for crit fishing. It, it's, it's too unreliable. I think it baits people into stuff and if it actually works, it breaks. Because being able to trigger crits more often is, um, that's, that's an RNG thing that you should be rewarded through volume of use, not, not just something you can pay for. So my approach is, is I'll let you pay for what could normally be done. Like you're going to be able to deal damage. If you happen to crit, if you happen to crit and you have assassination and you have the four mana and you spend it, yes, your crit is going to deal double damage, maximum double damage. But that's four mana that you're spending on. That is a big investment. That's also a super feel good moment. Like if you have assassination as a character, and you hit that natural 20, that is going to feel amazing if you choose to dump fat five mana to up your damage to 5d10 on top of whatever else you're doing, and then click in assassination for an extra four, like a rogue, for instance, using sneak attack to do 10d6 extra damage. And then on top of that, since you did a strike, you could spend five mana to ramp it up an extra 
5d10 damage. And then you could trigger for four mana, assassination. You only have 10, you only have 20 mana at 20th level. You can spend nine of it to do a super crit like that. But that's not really gonna be anything, that's not really gonna be much worse than what you can do with like say a Banishing Smite or like a, a fourth level Smite spell uh, from a, a Divine Smite from a Barbarian. And granted the sneak attack makes it over the end. But the chances of you having a natural 20 as a rogue while you have sneak attack active and still have nine mana available to dump into an assassination like this is it's gonna have to be like one of the first attacks of the day so like it, it's insane damage i'm aware of that but at 13th level i'm okay with it yeah it's pretty cool thank you i'm glad you're liking the system man um the the majority of people that have come through here at worst have said that is at worst a neat solution whether or not they'd want to use it themselves Honestly, I think a lot of a, a lot of these third-party publication stuffs, like the, like I call them couture design, like creating interesting solutions, is more of a. A lot of people, I think, when they buy them, is more as like a thought experiment. Like this is cool shit. I think it's neat to think about, but I don't know when I'd actually be able to get to play it. Like that's a shame. Like as a DM, I'm, I'm a forever DM. I don't play. Like I have like one game I get to play in once a month for like three hours. That's it. Otherwise, I'm a forever DM. And all the stuff that I build is stuff that I wish my players had access to. Like, I love playtesting my shit on my own team because these are all the type of things that I want players to be able to do because my philosophy as a DM is I'm only slowing you down. And my whole goal, like, to me, a DM is like playing with your dog. Your dog has his favorite chew toy and when he wants to play, he picks up his chew toy and runs over to you and he does a growly thing or whatever and then he wants you to, you know, tussle with him, like grab the chew toy and, and try to drag it out of his mouth. And if you can get away from it, you throw it so he can go grab it and bring it back and you can wrestle with it, try to wrestle it free from his mouth. And if you win wrestling it free, you throw it, he grabs it, he comes back. Players are the same way. Players want to be challenged. They want to expend their resources. Me as a DM, I'm basically grabbing hold of your favorite game mechanic and wrestling with it while you have it. And I... Uh, <laughs> So, like, you being able to, like, like if I've, I've got all these spells I can cast. Well, I'm going, to, as a DM, I want to create situations where I can bait you into spending a third-level spell slot to overcome this challenge. I don't care how you overcome this challenge. I just know you're going to overcome it. So, as a DM, I'm just creating a cascade of things that I know that you're going to overcome over the course of the adventure. If you want to blow all of your resources and mana and daily abilities and your proficiency bonus per day sort of things, getting over those challenges, I'm chewing through your battery of resources. And if I can get you to the end of the day where you've cashed out all of your resources, you're like, I am fucking exhausted. I need a long rest. If I can burn your characters down like that, that to me as a DM was a successful day of DMing. So I don't care if you can one shot the BVEG. He's just one of, of a, of a, uh, a Russian doll of increasingly more dangerous syndicates and enemies that oversee syndicates that are part of a syndicate that oversee a syndicate that's part of a syndicate. It just keeps going and going and going and going up the up the food chain until you're fighting gods at the fourth tier. And if I have to burn through, if I have to make you throw all your spells at that threat to get rid of it by the end of the day, then fucking fantastic. I did a good job as a DM knowing full well that you're probably going to defeat all my challenges in the end, especially by the time you hit 13th, 14th, 15th level. It's kind of hard to slow fifth level characters down. At that point, you're just, it's basically just art at that point. It's its like, what's the style of play? Anyway, that's thats a lot of pontification. So let's get back into this and see if we can actually finish out Assassinate within a normal time period. So Assassinate, starting at third level, you are at your deadliest when you get the drop on your enemies. You have advantage on attack rolls against any creature that hasn't taken a turn in the combat yet. In addition, any hit you score against a creature that is surprised is a critical hit. So that is an exploit of the critical hit system that could absolutely bend into the assassinate ability. We already know right off the cuff that 13th level, we're going to gain assassination. Oops, I lost it. Let's go down.
Already know off the bat, it's in the name. Four to three. Again, my player used almost everything they had just to end one boss, and then they're, and they are eight players at level six. That is, yeah, that is a fantastic feeling. Like you, you don't always have to burn down their day, but like if every two or three sessions you can get them to like they're just just absolutely scraping the barrel, like you don't want to have them in full tilt all the time because it just gets exhausting after a while. But every two or three, like you want to have a, like an easy day where they can't do anything wrong, low low workload. Another one is iffy, and then third, like one out of three is like super difficult. Super easy, whatever, super difficult, and keep rolling through that cascade. It, I, I find as a DM, like I don't have to do much more than that. It's pretty easy. And and then as a DM, I really don't care if how they resolve the challenge, how much of the place that they wreck, um, in a very in a very sandboxy sort of on the rails like a roller coaster sort of thing. Like I know where you guys are going to end up going. There's only so many like there's only so many paths that you can go, and I can have all of them lead to the same destination. You're choosing what route you take, and you're choosing how many resources you're going to burn down that track before you get to the next waypoint, which I know is going to be there. So as a DM, I'm just creating waypoints in the adventure that are different narrative beats. I'm going to set the narrative beats. And all the space in between those beats is is basically jazz, you know? Like you can play the space, you can create your own tempo, you can have your own language, your own synergized harmonies amongst your team, whatever you want, but you're eventually gonna filter into that narrative point that I have for you. And then it's gonna blow out, you're gonna do whatever the fuck you want for however lever long you want, and it's eventually gonna curve back into that narrative point. So it's narrative, 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 narrative. And all I have to do is have like, say, 40 or 50 narrative points lined up from level one to 20, and that'll take me through a 20 level campaign. I just need to know what my narrative points are along the way, and I only have to build them out every five levels. So if I'm gonna run a one to 20 campaign, the first five levels, I basically only really need 10 narrative points for me to be able to get them through fifth level. So anyway, that's some thoughts about that. Uh, let's see. So assassinate. I'm perfectly fine with assassination. Uh, assassinate as it is. No changes. Next up is going to be sixth level. Let's see what that is. <coughs> Infiltration. Oh, that's oh, sorry. They don't get it until ninth level. Derp. I'm still looking forward to that. I mean, people might hate the flavor narrative of changing all the subclasses to being the same scaffolding, but I am looking forward to it personally. I mean, I'm a huge fan of Strix, uh, of Strixhaven. Uh, the, the Strix class UA that got X because no one liked it. Then building the scaffold out like this, you know that Wizards is gonna come back with Strix classes. They invested time and effort in building those classes. They're not gonna throw it away. They're completely changing 5e so they can. They, honestly, it should have been that way from the beginning. If we had had structured scaffolding for all the subclasses to be the same level since day one of fifth edition, I don't think anyone would be questioning the narrative about a warlock not gaining their actual patron until say third level, um, or, or finally devoting themselves to their specific God as a cleric until third level, or their blood um, awakening inside of them as a sorcerer by third level. like. I, I think I think Wizard just kind of fucked themselves on that because they were just I don't think they thought fifth edition was gonna do what it does, and I don't honestly think they thought all these mechanical things through. If they had intended for 5e the last 20 years, I think they would have spent a little bit more time around structuring things so that it was more um, it was more well, more structured. It was something that they'd be able to sustain more easily and, and have more iterations. Like we now we're now seeing like with the with the playtest, the wizard now has the create spell, which is a reaction to him casting his own modified spell. We are now seeing Wizards of the Coast using a reaction to react to their own actions. And we haven't seen that before, but that's where 5e now finds itself in its design space because there's so many corners that it's, point, that it's painted itself. It's like, if... Um, Twister, the, the 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 game, the party game, Twister with the colors, you know, like red hand, like hand red, foot blue, right? It, Twister is basically a game of painted corners 
where you initially had this huge open design space where 5e could have been anything but they built it crappy so they started as the system continued to develop they started painting themselves into these isolated corners of we, we're now having creep we're now having uh power creep issues because we want to keep pumping out ideas but we don't have a lot of action economy or resources available to move in different directions so now we're folding in on each other using feats to take away class identity from each other so we create like these painted corners where they have to basically reside themselves in so now to be able to move from one corner to another they're basically having to play twister can i get my foot over to blue to be able to branch across to this new class option and one of the things that we're seeing for them to do that is downcasting and reacting to their own actions like this is late i would say this is late edition design issues i i'm i'm fine with it narratively but they didn't build it into the initial chassis showing up this far in in the redesign system shows that they painted themselves into a number of corners that they didn't have enough narrative space built into the game system for them to be able to have more ways of expressing mechanics like they now have to resort to these sort of tactics but i think that's just the natural result of them having done a bunch of shit already like these ideas aren't new to anybody that's really active in the third party content space or, or like the dm skill design space it it then just becomes an option of are the options that you're creating are they broken or not or do they fold within the ch like are they within the power scale of what 5e already is or are you breaking the bounded accuracy or are you breaking damage thresholds of stuff like how are you breaking this shit you know so anyway that's the thought process behind that um infiltrate okay so we're on infiltration expertise uh starting at ninth level you can unfailingly create false identities for yourself you must spend seven days and 25 gold to establish the history profession affiliation for your identity um you can't establish an identity that belongs to someone else for example you might acquire appropriate clothing letters of an introduction official looking certification to establish yourself as a member of a trading house from a remote city so you can insinuate yourself in the company of other wealthy merchants thereafter if uh if you adopt the new identity as a disguise other creatures believe you to be that person until given an obvious reason not to so infiltration expertise i am perfectly happy with infiltration expertise as is infiltration expertise i could probably find a way to modify it but i don't need to really just don't need to imposter Is that 13? Thank you. Uh, you gain the ability to unerringly mimic another person's speech, writing, and behavior. You must spend at least three hours studying these three components of the person's behavior, listening to speech, examining handwriting, and observing mannerisms. Uh, your ruse is indiscernible to the casual observer. If, you, if a wary creature suspects something is amiss, you have advantage on any charisma deception check you make to avoid detection. You know, the more I look at this, the less, it, the less and less this, this middle of the road just doesn't feel like assassins at all. I, I guess, like assassins, I think about snipers and sneaking up on people. I don't, I don't think about, like this, this shit's like long con stuff. Like I'm not going to take on the identity of somebody to assassinate someone. It's gonna sneak in and stab you in the eye. It's just this is more like a face, like an like an infiltrator class. That, that's where this shit belongs. I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm just maybe I'm just not smart. I'm just gonna leave it as no changes. Fuck you. Death strike. And was it seventeen? Fucking seventeen. it's <laughs> i just i can't i can't i can't i just i am struggling on this like you have to spend three hours studying this person when the fuck are you gonna have the opportunity to stare at somebody for three hours and not have them wonder why the fuck are you staring at me for three hours 
Like it's like it, it like if a if a yeah. Anyway, I could I could complain more about it, but we already know <laughs> it's fucked up. That's fucked up. Death Strike. You become a master of instant death. Uh, when you attack and hit a creature that is surprised, it must make a Constitution saving throw. On a failed save, double the damage of your attack against that creature. Okay. Wow. No changes. Like no changes. Did I just not change this entire class? Wow, oh, fuck you. Okay. There. That was easy. Let's find some stuff. Let's let's find some stuff to build into a power kit and we'll call it a day. Uh, let's see. Let's lean into the fun shit. Uh, let's see. Ambush. When making an ability check that can use the stealth skill or when rolling initiative, roll one power die per mana channeled, adding the highest roll to your result. Uh, yes, please. Ambush. XP1. That is going to allow us to trigger other stuff. The, uh, the assassinate, the assassinate ability and then later death strike. Uh, ambush is absolutely going to help with that because it helps you increase your uh, your initiative order. Uh, only a d6 at first, but eventually up to... Well, if you want to dump five mana into it to roll five d10, you'll probably get an eight, nine, or a 10 in there somewhere. So that's, that's value. And let's go down, let's go to sustain powers because it's first rank. We want to give them sustain powers so they have something that, I mean, they're only getting, they're only getting three mana at third level. So this is useful. Um, let's see. Inspired skill and sustain this power. You gain proficiency in a skill or tool of your choice. You can channel this power more than once simultaneously, choosing a different skill or tool with each channeling. So inspired skill is super fucking useful. Inspired skill. Sus one. What else is omnilinguist? So it's the same as power you can communicate with and be understood by any creature with a spoken language. Power armor, power shield, nah, 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 nah. Uh, ranged assault, mm, rogue stance, we already have it, Swiss assessment. There's a lot of, oof, man, there's a lot of fun stuff for rogues or, or just experts in general to want to use. Um... Uh, normally, you can't use powers, uh, strike powers with ranged attacks using this system. Um, let me let me correct that. Ranged weapons can't use strike powers unless you pick up a power that allows you to sustain it, which we have with range. Like you can like a, a melee weapons, you can throw within normal range and use a strike power with it, uh, or just any powers in general it has to be within normal range of a thrown weapon, like uh, like a dagger. I think it's like thirty feet. It's like as long as you're chan as long as you're throwing that dagger within 30 feet, you can channel powers with that attack, whether it's a strike or an exploit that lets you manipulate it or whatever. Um, but the ranged assault sustained power, it's a first rank power. Again, it's going if you decide to lock it to keep it all day, it reduces the maximum amount of mana that you can channel. So it is a natural debuff effect to anything that you would want to use ranged strikes with like if i'm making a melee attack i could channel five mana to deal five dice of damage plus whatever the whatever the the the, the kicker effect is but if i'm using a ranged weapon like a, a crossbow for instance um i could use i could do that uh strike uh strikes can be channeled when i hit a target with a ranged weapon at normal range i couldn't do so at far range with this um but i could like with that crossbow i could use that mana to attack something with a ranged weapon, like a, a crossbow, ranged weapon, whatever, um, within the normal range. But that is eating up my mana to do that. And if I lock it, I am, I am now reducing the maximum amount of mana I can channel. So like at 17th level, if I want to do this with a crossbow, I'm going to have to use ranged assault first, eating up, eating up my channeling budget, which would then reduce me like it, to... Um, uh, to 4d10 instead of 5d10. So the system is, it's not a huge nerf, but it, again, it's only within normal range. A ranger, however, 
can use ranged weapons as a fighting style, they eventually evolve to the point where they can make a ranged weapon attack with strikes and other powers at far range with a crop with a with a ranged weapon. But that's a ranger. That's what makes the ranger super cool compared to other stuff. Like a paladin deals more damage than anyone else can deal because they get extra power dice of damage when they use a strike power as part of their design uh, divine smite ability. So they're the kings of smiting and physical attack, but rangers become the king of doing range strike powers. Um, they, they can't do as much damage as a paladin can, but they can do it further away than anyone else. So that gives you a good reason to stay involved with the ranger long term. Plus the way that the scaffolding works for multi-classing, it's worth it for you to take five or 10 levels of ranger to accumulate those ranks of power and then multi-class out of the ranger once you get what you need from it and then dive into say the fighter for extra attacks or the ranger for the sneak attack stuff or whatever wherever else you want to go to exploit stuff or even potentially just stay with ranger for 20 levels because you'll be able to get up to fifth rank uh, fourth rank powers at 13th uh, then you could dive out like once you get the 14th levels of ranger you could dive out of that and go into sixth level like maybe pick up six levels of barbarian and mix your ranger and barbarian together, but still have access to five ranks of power and the D20, uh, the D10 die rolls in the end. But you're then picking and choosing between the martial classes. How like for a like for a spellcaster, the the best way for a spellcaster to accumulate their their greatest power is to stay single class focused, so that they can get up to that ninth level spell selection. They can get ninth level spell slots as a 10-10 cleric wizard but they can't cast above fifth level spells. That wizard has to stay stuck inside a wizard till 17th level if he wants that ninth level spell to go with that ninth level spell slot. But with this power system, a character doesn't have to go beyond 13th level to get all the really good powers. You can then, diver you can then diversify and go into other stuff, but if there's nothing that, uh, if there's nothing you want of a fourth rank power, like if you really don't need anything at fourth rank, then you could stop at ninth level and still have access up to third level powers. And then you can take your entire half class and go someplace else with it and still be able to get your mana pool growing, still have your power dice grow, still have the amount of powers that you know grow. You're just changing, you're just changing who is having that power accumulate for you. So fun stuff. Uh, but we were talking about uh, Assassin for the, honestly, I think range assault. I, honestly, I think range assault makes a lot of sense for the range uh, for the assassin because it gives you access to that ranged sus one. Because it gives you access to the ranged weapon to use powers with to, to do the smite stuff. I think that's enough to be worth considering to have inside of your kit to use if you need it, as well as like daggers and stuff at long range. That's useful. Um, let's go down to feats to see if there's any feat that we might want instead of ambush at first level. But ambush makes a lot of sense at first level, I think. Is there any feat that we want specifically? Well, sharpshooter. Duh. Um, yeah, let's take sharpshooter at five. That's fine. Sharpshooter. We'll have to reevaluate these things once uh, once uh, one D and D is done becoming sixty. But I'm pretty happy with that. So let's go to ninth level now. This one's easy to flesh out. Jesus, ninth we have up the third rank powers that we can take advantage of. So let's see what third rank sustained powers Ghost Walker. While sustaining this power as a bonus action, including this round, and the power is channeled uh, using a bonus action, you can become incorporeal. Any round you end within an object, you gain one level of exhaustion and you're ejected from the space, returning to the last position you occupied or the nearest location to that space. Ghost Walker ain't bad for infiltration. I'd rather save Ghost Walker for the Master Thief subclass. I think it belongs there better than assassinate, though being able to walk through a wall is a super useful assassination thing to do. I think, uh, I think there might be something else that we can find that would be more useful. Let's see. Maybe I'm wrong. Well, that's fucking useful in general. Quick. While sustaining this power, gain advantage on charisma and dexterity checks in general. Yes, please. That's a second rank sustain power. Quick.
What else is in here? Astute. While sustaining this power, you gain advantage on intelligence and wisdom checks. That's also incredibly tempting. Trap Springer. While this power is sustained, gain oh, that would be a Master Thief sort of thing. Um, fuck, that's useful. Let's see what else is out there. Is there something? Some, if, see if there's something a little bit more iconic. While sustaining this power, you gain proficiency in a skill or tool of your choice. Um, your damage increases by one power die per mana burn. The creature must make a wisdom saving throw or be paralyzed. The creature can attempt to end this effect at the end of each of its turns by succeeding a wisdom saving throw. Not bad. Hmm. Uh, let's see. What other... Is there anything else? Because I could definitely go with a stew. Uh, stolen fate as a reaction to when a creature you can see within 30 feet makes an ability check, attack roll, or saving throw. You can curse them to roll again. They use the lower d20 result, and you can use the higher die result to replace the result after rolling a d20, but before determining success for one ability, check, attack, roll, or saving throw, this benefit is lost if the result isn't used by the end of your next turn. So you can steal somebody's die roll, make them roll again, and take the better die result for yourself. And keep it on hand in case it's better than your die roll, which I think is a better silvery barbs in general. That, that's just me, maybe. Moving target. Uh, moves within reach of your melee attack. Evasive of footwork, deflection, curse of exposure. Curse of exposure might not be a bad one for assassin. As a reaction to a creature within 30 feet taking damage, if the creature is resistant to the damage, it can't benefit from resistance to the damage rolled. Alternatively, if it's immune to the damage, it is instead only resistant. So curse of exposure is actually a pretty good one for an assassin specifically. And that is a reaction one. Now let's see, is there something else that we like? So we'll take one, 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 one. <laughs> There's so many cheap things these guys are picking up. I love it. Uh, oh fuck, Flicker, uh, maybe that's something. Flicker Pounce, uh, you can teleport up to 30 feet to a space within five feet of a creature you can see and make a weapon attack against it. If the attack succeeds, you can t choose to teleport back to your original position. If the attack fails, you don't teleport the second time. Flicker Strike is kind of cool. And that is, what is that, an exploit? No, I, I think that's a maneuver. Yeah, it's a maneuver. Ah, Flicker Pounce is kind of cool. That's, oh man, teleporting in, stabbing somebody in the face and then, and then disappearing. That actually is pretty fucking cool. We'll go with that. Flicker Pounce. Maneuver three. So let's see if there's let's see if there's something we like better than quick. You become incorporeal until the beginning of your next turn. You can move through other creatures and objects as if they were difficult terrain. If you end your turn in a space occupied by another creature or object, you instead end the turn in the mostly recently occupied space that you move through during your turn. Any uh, attacks that are during phase deal, any attacks you make during phase deals force damage. That's pretty cool. Uh, target creature you see within 30 feet makes a Christmas saving throw fail equals no move or bonus action until success at the end of each of its turns. That's horribly written. We'll come back and fix it another time. Vanish, ooh, become invisible until the beginning. Oh, that's super useful. But is it more useful than vanish? You become invisible until the beginning of your next turn for one mana. Uh, we saw that in the um, in the in the uh, Rangers playtest. It's uh, it's a downcast version of uh, invisibility. So let's see. Sus too quick. 
quick equals. Well, sustain this power, you gain advantage on charisma. Charismatic. On charisma and dexterity checks. That's really good. I'm going to take flicker pounds and drop that down. Uh, efficient power, flicker pounds. There. I think I'm content with that. I knew, uh, it looks like I missed something. All right, all man. Thanks a lot, dude. Banish for the assassin. Fantastic. Yep, okay. Hey, that's it. Sorry I missed you, Taryn, but thanks a lot for being here, my guy. Uh, and Alan, I think I'm going to cut that today. So uh, we've been at this for... Almost, yeah, we've been at this for two and a half hours. Uh, I think uh, the arcane, the uh, arcane archer, is who we have on deck for the fighter, but that's got a, a menu list of stuff for the arrows. So I think I want to hold off on that until next time. Um, but um, yeah, so that's my deal. Uh, I'm going to be back tomorrow morning. In what will that be? Um, Four twelve. I'll be back in about sixteen hours, fifteen, sixteen hours. Uh, we'll do a few hours worth of NPC token creation uh, for the uh, Spelljammer Light of Zaraxxus conversion that we're doing. And uh, tomorrow is tomorrow's Wednesday, right? So I'll be back tomorrow morning and then probably back tomorrow like around 2 o'clock. Um, I don't know what we're going to do, but we'll do something. So yeah, that's it for now. Thanks a lot for hanging out, guys. And... Uh, Um, it's well, we're done. Hey, hey, Fred, <laughs> I thought you were going to bed or something, dude. Um, we uh, we fleshed out the uh, we fleshed out the assassin. Uh, we finished the uh, uh, the path of the beast for the barbarian, uh, but I really don't have the bandwidth to do arcane archer today. So we're gonna come back and do arcane archer next week. And um, so I'm gonna bail for now. And <laughs> I'm up now. Hell yeah, dude. But uh, yeah, I got to go. So uh, I got some things on my plate I got to attend to. So I love hanging out with you guys. But uh, I will see you all on the other side. So thanks a lot for being here.